thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Musa Zechko. Possibly some people have never seen me. I've lately become so old because of the lockdown. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome every one of you on this webinar. It is interesting that our antenatal care coverage has gone up, but the quality of the antenatal care remains uh, poor, and we need uh, the reason for these webinars is to improve the quality of antenatal care so that those who come actually in contact with us get a better deal than what they have been getting over time. I must apologize for the late starting. It is eight minutes past the starting time. Uh, I got a mix up in, um, <laughs> in the technology, but uh, we have caught up. Uh, we have two presenters today, and that is Dr. Sara Nakulwa and uh, Dr. Mike Kagawa. Uh, Dr. Sara Nakulwa will be taking us through the, the torches the diseases that infectious diseases that would occur in pregnancy that could actually lead to poor maternal and infant outcomes. And uh, then Dr. Mike Kagawa would take us through the HIA, the PMTCT during pregnancy. So for purposes of saving time, I'll request Dr. Sarah to go ahead with the presentation, which is already loaded. And uh, she will present for 30 minutes. And then we have a question and answer session with her because she needs to go back to labor. She's on duty today. Uh, without wasting more time, let me invite Dr. Sarah Nakura to make her presentation. Sarah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, members. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Sech Kubo and uh, the other organizers. I hope I'm, I'm, uh, I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Dr. Sechku, you can, eh? Okay, yes. that's great. So um, we are going to talk about uh, three infections during pregnancy. And um, when, I, when I get another opportunity, I'll talk, I'll talk about uh, malaria, uh, CMV and rubella, but not at this setting. So the first one is because of... Uh, um, a topic that I've, have been uh, researching on for the last four years. So it's understandable why it, it features among the infections that we are going to discuss. So that is the outline of the presentation. And uh, why do we need to know about these torches? Um, the significance is that it's uh, transmissible to the fetus uh, and the neonate neutral intrapartum, and there are significant uh, fetal and neonatal mortality, but as well as uh, early and later childhood morbidity. Uh, the babies may get uh, abnormal growth, uh, clinical abnormalities. Uh, the next slide is what I'm on. And then, um, so the infections we are talking about, uh, toxoplasmosis, syphilis, rubella, CMV, and HSV2, and as I've already informed you, we are going to first talk about the first three uh, for today. So what is a happy simplex um, virus type two? Uh, um, happy, it has two types, happy simplex type one and type two. Type two is the frequent genital infection. And in the developed world, we have about five to 30% of the population um, infected with uh, herpes, and in the developing world, 30 to 80 percent. And in Uganda, in one of the studies done in 2014, 63.8 percent of women uh, were uh, HSV2 seropositive. And in Mulago Hospital, in one of the studies done among patients who were uh, uh, HIV positive, Okay, we have had known HIV status, positive and negative, to 67.2, where 60% was negative, well, HIV negative women, and 80, almost 80% were HIV positive women. So happy simplex uh, is quite prevalent in our setting. And um, some of the features include um, painful genital ulcers, uh, itching, uh, painful micturition, fever, 
tender inguinal lymphadenopathy and headache. So hopefully many of you um, ask about such uh, uh, symptoms and also when you examine, you have that in mind. That is a global um, HSV2 image. And uh, as you realize, majority um, of, the, of the patients who have herpes are in the, uh, well, you can look at the African um, context. So anyway, it's quite a problem. Let's go to the next slide. And what is this herpes? It's a DNA virus which has about 74 genes. And um, why are we interested in, in this DNA virus? Why am I interested in telling you about this? It's because uh, we, we detect this DNA when we do um, uh, tests, either from a, a vesicle or if we take cervical swabs of um, women who have a happy simplex. And, um, and this virus also has um, a tegument which has short acting like filaments. Um, it, it's indicated in the picture. And it also has an envelope which has 600 glycoprotein spikes. And these are the, those glycoprotein spikes, I've, I've talked about them so that uh, uh, you know that these are, um, we test in, in the serological tests, uh, glyco antibodies to those glycoprotein are the ones that are used to detect HSV2 or even HSV1. They are type specific serological tests. So when this uh, infection um, comes, or a woman is infected, uh, you can have a primary infection where you get the other symptoms. Uh, I told you about vesicles, which eventually may ulcerate. But uh, many times, uh, the women may clear the infection because of their immunity. But when they get pregnant, or if they're immune compromised, there's reactivation because the virus hides in the sacral plexus and then during periods of uh, immune suppression or pregnancy um, or other causes, then you have um, these uh, viruses uh, coming reactivated and they can infect the baby, but also cause other perinatal, uh, other perinatal as well as obstetric poor outcomes. So what are some of these um, adverse outcomes that we are talking about? HSV2 may cause preterm delivery via um, the cytokines. I'll show you uh, a picture on the next slide of how this happens. And uh, there's also neonatal HSV2 transmission, which is related to viral shedding in the genital tract. When um, there is a virus in the genital tract, it may be detectable. And when it's detectable, we say that person is shedding virus in the genital tract. And herpes can also lead to um, a weakening of the membranes, causing premature rupture of membranes. And it can work alone or with other genital infections. So this is the, the next slide uh, talks about um, how uh, adverse outcomes uh, may come about with genital infections. Uh, can you show the next slide, please? Yes. So we have. Um, uh, if we have infections like herpes or other genital uh, infections, you get a uh, leukocyte response, uh, receptor activation, and then there are cytokines that are released, uh, released such as uh, tumor necrotic factor, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and these may release prostaglandins. Of course, uh, I think many of you still remember uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, Prostaglandin, the fact that they, they cause preterm labor, but also they release proteases which can um, dissolve membranes and lead to rupture of membranes as well as collagenases. And that cascade can lead to preterm delivery and other undesirable outcomes, uh, especially from the preterm delivery. Okay, so that was uh, about the, some of the things that can occur if membranes ruptured apart from preterm labor, you can get infections um, to the mother, to the baby. The babies may score poorly and they may need to be admitted in the NICU. Um, they may get other infections as well as they may even die. So it's quite serious. But what can we do about it? So during pregnancy, um, 
uh, well, even in non-pregnant women, if someone got herpes infection, we can give uh, antivirals. One of the main of treatment is uh, a cyclovir, which is a nucleoside analog. Um, and when it's given to women, it reduces genital shedding of herpes and thus neonatal transmission. It works by selective inhibiting HSV2 uh, DNA replication. If someone has ulcers which are visible, you would give at any stage a cycle of 400 milligrams TDS for 10 days. But otherwise, whether someone has ulcers or not, uh, studies by, by uh, many studies have shown that you give, uh, if you give suppressive acyclovir 400 milligram TDS from 36 weeks, you will reduce the um, incidence of the babies getting happy simplex. Other drugs include famcyclovir and valacyclovir, but we do not have, they are quite expensive. Acyclovir is uh, cheaper and it still works. If someone has ulcers, uh, genital ulcers, or if um, in the third trimester, it will be better to deliver by cesarean section, prevent the baby getting uh, happy simplex uh, infection. But if there are no lesions and someone took a cyclovir, then vaginal delivery is safe. And uh, we obviously avoid invasive procedures during labor. So, um, yeah, so that was about uh, happy simplex. Then we go to toxoplasma. Toxoplasma gondii, what is this? Um, it's a protozoa that is available in, and it infects humans. It's acquired usually during childhood. And uh, if it's acquired for the first time during pregnancy, then the babies can get infected. And uh, where does this infection come from? It comes from domestic cats and uh, other hosts, uh, which are, we don't necessarily see, but the cats, we, we have them in our homes. And then also, um, you can also get it if you if you eat a uh, poorly cooked chicken. The chicken would have been infected from the oocytes as well, which were from the cat or other animals. And then these these two are the source of infection in humans. And about ten to fifty percent of adults aged fifteen to forty five years are seropositive for T. Gondii. I don't have the figure for Uganda. Um, so what does it cause? It causes an acute maternal infection, which is usually asymptomatic. But sometimes you can have uh, mild uh, fevers, chills, sweat, headache, myalgia, pharyngitis. Um, anyway, similar to some of the symptoms we don't want to get uh, during this period of time. So lymphadenopathy is also common. When should we test women for toxoplasma? If someone, if the mother has a fever and you find she has ad, adenopathy, uh, especially cervical adenopathy, and you don't have another cause of it, but also if you have a, a scan and uh, the baby has some features of congenital toxoplasmosis, such as intracranial hyperechogenic foci, when you do a scan, um, we should read what some of the radiologists uh, report. And if there's some bit of calcification, then maybe you should test the mother to see. And how do you test? You do a serology, um, or, or if you have, um, um, well, we, we would test serology. But if we were, if the baby if the baby was sick, or if the mother is sick, you can also do PCR um, on blood. So the risk of why are we interested in toxoplasmosis? Uh, because there's a risk, uh, in case a mother got infection in the third trimester, then um, the baby can easily get infected. But also, um, when, the, when there is a, when the, someone has um, the source, if they have cuts at home, well, you were un unaware of their uh, toxoplasmosis status, they're likely, and also if a mother, a mother who is immune compromised, such mothers can also have a risk of prenatal transmission to their babies. And uh, do we, is all hope lost? Is there something that we can use? Obviously, there are drugs we can use. There is spiramycin, 
uh, which can be used even in pregnancy and uh, pyrimethamine as uh, sulfadiazine. That's what we usually have in our setting, which is easily accessible. But it's not good to be using the first trimester, the pyrimethamine. We are losing you. The diagnosis. Uh, and this drug. But then it would be good to give a folinic acid um, to, to try and prevent. Sarah, we are losing you. Hematology. Yeah. Um, took care. Uh, um, am I still audible? No, we are losing you. I lost you yeah. somewhere <laughs> with the uh, first trimester. You can get the roof, you can get the roof of Kawempe Hospital. Oh, um, uh, there was a call. Okay. Um, um, Dr. Ka Dr. Sajkubo. Yes. Can I continue? We can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know how to block phones <laughs> when I'm on Zoom. Anyway, so what about the prenatal care of patients? It's routine, but of course, uh, if there is a diagnosis, then we need to treat. And uh, congenital toxoplasmosis does not affect the timing or route of delivery, but uh, we may need to do tests of the placenta when the placenta comes out. And then if the baby is symptomatic, then um, uh, we, we, we request the, the pediatricians to come and take over. And uh, we should give them the mother's history and serology. And obviously they will examine the baby's eyes and the central nervous system. And they will, um, the diagnosis will be by serology of the baby's sera and um, PCR if, of the CSF if the baby has um, neurological signs. And of the mainstay of prevention would be to avoid the sources of infection. That makes, if you to eat food, it should be meat, it should be well cooked, not these uh, some of the menus where the food is, is rare, where it's half done. So um, our third infection is uh, syphilis. So syphilis is caused by a spiral kit called uh, Triponema pallida. Is someone calling again? And uh, we are interested in it because it also has a reflux placental infection to the, the fetus. Yes, <laughs> but I've blocked. So am I still hard? Yes. Next time I'll, I'll try and use the laptop. So, um, syphilis, um, um, it, it's also prevalent. Um, it's measured uh, prevalence of maternal syphilis in 2016 was about 0.69% and congenital syphilis about uh, 473 per 100,000 live births. In Uganda, about 2% uh, of our natural women were seropositive for syphilis. And, that, and, um, and yes, this is something that we should uh, screen uh, routinely. So all pregnant women at the first prenatal encounter, they should have a screening test. The good thing these days is being done together with HIV, but still some patients miss a syphilis test. And uh, women at high risk of infection, especially multiple sexual partners, and uh, if 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 they are um, um, at risk of getting syphilis from their spouses, uh, then you repeat screening 28 to 32 weeks, and you may also need to repeat screening at delivery. Um, when you take a history and you get to know someone's sexual history especially the current, then you may decide whether you need to repeat screening, even though you had a, a negative test at the, at the first encounter. 
So women who have not been screened in pregnancy, who deliver still birth after 20 weeks of gestation, should also have a screen at delivery. How do we screen? We do a serology, and we start with non triponemo tests like RPR, and then uh, if it's positive, then we confirm with the TPHA or TPPA. Here we call it TPHA. So syphilis has stages, primary where you get a local chancre, uh, secondary, which is systemic, and uh, um, latent, where it may be for over a year with or without symptoms, tertiary, where there are cardiovascular uh, symptoms, or where they have the uma. Then neurosyphilis is also, uh, it comes in the later stages. The main step of treatment is uh, benzathine penicillin 2.2 on each buttock, and you, and, and you get three doses. It's usually the most adequate treatment for syphilis. So, there are other um, uh, drugs that can be used. Um, on the next slide, uh, erythromycin, heptiaxone, you treat for about 14 days, azithromycin. But also, Kawempe is tricky. We can, hear. We can, can hear, you hear you. Can hear me? Okay. So, um, but what is key on this slide is that erythromycin and azithromycin do not cross the placental barrier completely. So, the baby is not effectively treated. So, when you treat women um, during pregnancy with uh, these non penicillin regimens, uh, the babies need to be treated. So the pediatricians need to be informed so that the babies are given treatment for 10 to 15 days with penicillin. Okay, so um, again, uh, as we said, um, um, syphilis has uh, complications, which we'll talk about later. But also sometimes the treatment of syphilis may uh, precipitate a uh, reaction uh, Jarish eczema reaction. Maybe Dr. Kaga will pronounce that for me better. But this is sometimes an acute febrile reaction accompanied by headache, uh, which happens due to a cytokine storm due to death of the spirochetes. And so it, that may precipitate preterm labor and even fetal distress. And the management, you just support the care but even syphilis itself has its own problems. It causes miscarriage. The next slide. Yes, causes miscarriage, preterm birth, uh, stillbirth, impaired fetal growth, and also congenital syphilis, which um, uh, it can be seen from uh, even when the baby is still intrauterine, but also at delivery. A, a delivery, you can see um, a necrotizing funicitis, but also uh, the baby uh, may have a fever. But in triuterine, you, you could see hepatomegaly for the baby or signs of uh, high drops, but can also cause the baby to die. Uh, pregnancy monitoring, pregnancies with syphilis, the next slide could be managed, uh, should be managed by both obstetrics and infectious disease specialists. And for the obstetrics, we need to scan at 20 weeks. Um, and uh, if a mother, uh, uh, if, if, a, if a baby has features of high growth because of syphilis, then you may need to deliver. But otherwise, um, uh, the pregnancy can be monitored if the baby is fine. And, um, and the, can you hear me still? Hello? Yes, we Hello. can hear. I can hear you, Nibarara. We, we can okay. hear you, but it seems we've lost the slides. Don't hey, the slides went. Uh, just a minute. I think I'm fixing Stella, it. Do, can we have the slides? We, we, are, yeah. we are almost yeah. through. I'm working on it, sir. Okay, but what I'm saying is that uh, 
if a baby is showing congenital syphilis and the condition is worsening from scan into a when you do a scan, um, and, but otherwise the pregnancy uh, proceeds as usual and uh, any delivery is as uh, obstetric in, obstetrically indicated. But a mother who presents and her TPH is positive in labor, uh, we should treat, but also the babies um, should be given treatment, as I've already said. Okay. So we are actually on our finish. So what are the some of the key messages that for these three infections, you need to think about all this, uh, maybe dysuria, and ask about... Someone is calling again. Uh, ulcers and, and, and so you're thinking of, is it happy if someone... Uh, um, no. I think it's the network now. Okay. So height of suspicion, you need to think about it. If you don't think about it, it won't come to you. We need to educate women on prevention. Some of the preventive measures, uh, uh, condom use, uh, treating the partners or partner, and and then we need to screen for routine infections such as syphilis, especially per national guidelines. It's one of the infections with herpes. It's a history, depending on uh, if someone has an explained history and examination. If you find someone has an explained uh, cervical adenopathy, then you're thinking of, uh, could it be toxo? If someone has history of gentle ulcers, um, maybe then you'd think of happy simplex. So there is targeted screening because the tests are not there in routine practice, but uh, you can access them uh, in case um, the patient um, ha the, has an indication for testing. Then you need to treat those who are positive. You need to monitor the pregnancy. You need to work with the pediatric team and, and infectious disease specialists. So we will continue the discussion, uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sarah, for the presentation. It has been a whirlwind. <laughs> Your mind is presenting almost. Eh, sorry. <laughs> uh, there are some questions which need answers. Ah. I've heard someone, some old man's voice. Is that was Sarah in Imbarara? Uh, the first one is that uh, the laboratory diagnosis of happy simplex, how available is it to look for the DNA or are we using serological tests? Um, okay, so um, many, lab many, many labs in town can be able to do in-house um, uh, PCR tests in case somebody has a has a gentle ulcer if you take a cervical swab and then uh, the serology um, can also be done but most, uh, the around um, around ten dollars the again. PCR cost serology costs around ten dollars. And the PCR costs around $20, $25. So the PCR is a quite But it's available. Um, Can you hear the answer? I beg your pardon? Did you hear Today, the answer? Partly. partly. We hardly, hardly. had you. Yes. Okay. So, uh, serology is a, is a serology and PCR are available, but they are expensive, especially in labs in Kampala. Like MBN lab can do the serology 
and the labs in the in the medical school like immunology lab can do the serology serology costs around ten dollars pcr costs around 25 us dollars all right yes uh, then the next question is that how do you ensure adherence of uh, of that how do you ensure that patients can adhere to erythromycin given the high pill burden Hmm, interesting question. The best treatment would be penicillin and it's an injectable and you're sure the patient gets it. Um, that is why even in literature, they even try and desensitize people on penicillin. For example, you give them oral penicillin and manage them in case they get a reaction and hopefully they can be desensitized uh, but otherwise, if we are not aware of the desensitization regimen, and if we don't have allergy specialists... Good camp. This Saturday we have uh, it's like a party kind of workout. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Um, that is not part of the answer. <laughs> Please, please, you please come back. Can you those people at the party? So the <laughs> adherence um, um, is tricky. That's why people, um, the literature emphasizes penicillin. I don't know whether you had the part about trying to desensitize using uh, yeah, we oral penicillin. Yes, yeah. if we can talk to some allergy specialists to, to teach us that part. But otherwise, you counsel someone that uh, this is serious, what can happen to your baby and what can happen to you. You can tell them about the different stages of syphilis, as well as the complications, starting from first trimester to even the baby getting syphilis. Uh, the next one would be a general question, but uh, I don't hmm. know whether I can leave it for Mike Agar because he's still around. How have we organized the delivery of these services, prenatal, intranatal, and possibly postnatal, given the challenges of COVID-19 now? Hmm. I can leave that to Kagawa. Maybe what I can All say right. to is that maybe I'll answer it later. Yes. Well, you answer, answer it right away. Yeah, no, okay. you can answer it later because we'll have more time with you, Sarah might be leaving. But the other question would be that is, is uh, Bethas in still in use a single dose for syphilis? Hello? Sarah? Sarah? Is there? Uh, Sarah may have. Sarah might have escaped. Sarah might have escaped. Sarah, are you back? No, Sarah might have gone. <laughs> Do you have her somewhere? But she seems to be talking. Hello? Sarah, we can't hear you. Okay, in the interest of time, let's go through the remaining questions, I think, with Mike. Uh, ah, but this one was supposed to go to Sarah. If the RPR or the VDR are positive and you do not have a TPPA, what do you do? Mike, do you have an answer? Maybe what I can say to that is that you, if you take a good history and uh, there's evidence of previous treatment, maybe you don't have to treat, but I would probably think that if there's no evidence of previous treatment, you may have to treat based on those findings. Uh, so, Musa, you can supplement, but that's my view. Yeah, uh, the mainstay of, of diagnosis of syphilis was actually the RPR and VDR test. 
which are non-direct tests. And it, uh, eventually we morphed or we grew into the direct testing. But the treatment used to be actually based on the non-direct non tests. So if the RPR is positive and you do not have a way of confirming the direct test, please go ahead and treat. And in some laboratories now they have moved out from VGRL and, uh, and R R R RPR and they're now really doing as a first test of, uh, of phosphorus uh, using the TPPA. Yeah, there was also another question. At what gestational age would you give benzaphine? Mike? Mike? I think benzaphine being a penicillin, yes. At what benzaphine being a penicillin is generally safe throughout pregnancy. So I think if you really had to start treatment, I wouldn't see any contraindication at all gestational ages because penicillins are generally safe throughout pregnancy. Yeah, the penicillins and macrolides are safe during pregnancy. However, there were some studies which showed that long-term use of uh, macrolide antibiotics during pregnancy may actually predispose to uh, cerebral palsy. And that appeared in the Lancet, I think, some four years ago. But of course, if it is, uh, we have said that the main soft treatment should be penicillin based, especially in our setting. I think that's what we have for Sarah since we are running low on time. Uh, let's get uh, the presentation from Mike Kagawa to be starting and we listen to his presentation. Thank you very much for keeping with us. It is quite a team. We are excited about it. Mike? Thank you, Musa. Yeah, I don't know. I had shared the slides with uh, the team over there. Elado. Load my my slides all the same. Elado, do you have the slides? Let me share from this side. Yeah, you may. Yes, I do. I do have the slides, but I don't know if Dr. Kagawa would want to share. His. Let, let, let me let me share from this side. Okay. And who are you keeping busy? Well, who is keeping you busy? No, I am. I'm very attentive, sir. <laughs> you have some background noise, eh? Yes, sir. Let me work on it. Okay, colleagues. Um, I was requested to share with you something on. Uh, On, on prevention of mother-child transmission and um, for those who don't know me maybe you better maybe put on my video so that I don't know they have to put on a mask <laughs> <laughs> Mike you might have to put on a mask <laughs> <laughs> But I guess I don't have to put on a mask. Anyhow, let's go through this. And uh, I don't know whether you can see the slides. Yeah, we can see them. OK. So this is going to be our presentation outline. That will briefly look at uh, the introduction. We will. Um, have a brief on HIV AIDS and uh, pregnancy, that is uh, PMTCT or MTCT, and uh, remind ourselves of the factors that increase this infection, the strategy. Yeah. 
Is your internet also a problem? Because we can't hear you now. Hello? Mike? Just for prevention. We are losing you. We can't hear you. Oops. Mike. I got interrupted, but I think I'm back. Can you hear me now? We can see you, but not the slides. And oh, the slides have hear. gone off. Let me share them again. I don't know something uh, went wrong. Can we share from this side? Maybe a little. Can we? It's okay. I can share them. Are they there now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, so yes it's let's, there. Okay, let's proceed. I was saying that would be our presentation outline, so I'll go straight ahead. I hope you can hear me. Yes, you can. Good. So this is just a reminder of what HIV is all about. We all know that HIV is of two types. HIV 1 and HIV 2. And the common virulent and easily transmissible compared to HIV 2. And then we have how we define HIV infection, HIV disease, and AIDS whereby HIV infection is presence of HIV in the bloodstream of an individual with or without symptoms, and then HIV disease is when they show symptoms, and finally, AIDS is when there is overwhelming signs and symptoms of disease. These are things we know. Next is this uh, immune profile that we all need to be aware of, especially if we are going to talk about mother-to-child transmission. In this graph, we have three graphs that you can look at. We have a tracing for the viral load, a tracing for the HIV antibodies, and a tracing for the CD4 counts. As we all recall that immediately after infection, the individual gets a viral spike, which the body tries to control, and it brings it down, but not so effective or load goes up again. This has implications of mother-child transmission, so we need to be aware of it. And then the other graph is the CD4 counts, which keep reducing. As you are aware that these are the cells where the virus multiplies, replicates, and destroys them in the process. But the virus somehow doesn't get destroyed. And then the red or maroon graph is showing us the antibodies which rise after a time. which is referred to as the window period. Times patients who are negative, but when they are actually infected, that's because the antibodies, which are the ordinary tests, are not yet formed. So the window period is about three months in some people, and that's why we normally recommend a repeat HIV test, even among these pregnant women. Right, so the profile that we've looked at uh, manifests clinically as the stages of disease, where we have uh, primary infection, We can't hear you. Clean into AIDS. That is what is happening. You need to. You can't hear me still. We can hear you now. Okay, I'll take off the video. Maybe that will make life a bit easier. All right. You can hear me, Musa. Yes, yes. Right. So I was just saying that uh, what we have seen in this graph is. Is uh, reflected in the clinical. Are you, am I there? Yes, now you are there. Okay. So we have uh, those three stages of disease, which are referred to as clinical manifestations of disease, and they are in the background is the main profile with which we have seen. Right. So talking about PMTCT, that is prevention of mother-child transmission. This is the global profile as of 
2016. And you can see that in transmission rates, a coverage of about 88% of mothers who can access PMTCT services and about 8% of the baby as the prevalence. This is the Ugandan profile as of 2019, that we have about 1.5 million people living with HIV and uh, about 5.8% uh, and then we have about 3,000 new infections and 21,000 AIDS related deaths. In Uganda, the ARV coverage is about 85% among adults and 65% in children. Now, looking at the 1.5 million people living with HIV, you'll realize that about 4% of our population is pregnant women. So you can work that out to see how many pregnant women are living with HIV in Uganda and who are affected more than the older women, especially women in the reproductive age group. This is how big the problem is that uh, of all new infections of HIV that we've looked at in the previous slide, about 18% of these are in children as a result of mother-child transmission. And about 90% of infected children would have acquired this infection from their mothers. Um, use of unsafe blood transfusions and maybe sharing of, of sharps. Talking about mother-child transmission, we all know that transmission can occur anytime during pregnancy, it can occur during labor and delivery, and it can occur during breastfeeding. And most transmissions actually occur during labor and delivery, and early stage and late stage disease. If you refer to the graph that uh, I showed, you see it stage disease at the times when we have the highest viral load and viral load has implications on mother-child transmission. Another fact is that transmission during, during early pregnancy is very rare and indeed conception starts off without infection because the gametes have no CD4 receptors and therefore whether the father and mother are both positive, the conceptors will start off as HIV negative for the simple fact that The gametes don't have CD4 receptors. Risk of transmission ranges from 15 to 45 percent. That is, uh, out of every 100, 100 women, about 15 to 45 percent will have babies who are infected. And with intervention, empty CD rates can be reduced to as low as 5 percent. There's some background noise there. I don't know where it's coming from. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Please continue. Right. So I was to less than 5% in a population like ours, or even to as low as 2% in populations that ordinarily do not breastfeed. And um, on top of the ARVs that we give, we also would like to encourage good clinical practice amongst our health workers. Mm -hmm. This is the progress Uganda has mm -hmm. made we'll in get... terms of the 1990 targets. I'm thinking that we all are familiar with the ministry, but uh, as of uh, data from 2019, we have on, on the first 90, we have reached as high as 89%. So we are almost hitting the target that 89% of all infected people are aware of their HIV status. And 92% uh, of Pardon me? I thought it is 89% of the population know their HIV status. Hello? Wow. 
We can't hear you now. Mike, your network is really, really bad. Mike, we lost you. Hello? Mike? Mike? What's up? Am I back? <laughs> Am I back now? Okay. Yeah, you're back, but you're the best next to you. Musa and uh, et al, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, sir. And can we see the slides? Yes. Right. I was just explaining that these are percentages of percentages. So the absolute percentages are indicated below. That of all. It's gone again. Uh, and so, I beg your, I beg your pardon, sir. Yeah, the network keeps like, we can't hear you clearly. Let me try to change. Uh, let me try to change. Uh, let me try to change the net, the, the, the internet and see whether it will be better. So hang on a little and I switch. Okay. Dr. Musa. Yes. This there is, is uh, someone by the names of Catherine. There's yes. someone by the names of Catherine who keeps coming on and off. Yes. And I think that that is also disorganizing the presenter. Can we just... to control it, Emma, for me, it's okay. All right. Uh, members, let's just take a minute and uh, wait for Mike to come back on air. He's trying to switch the service, the internet service provider. Uh, one thing which I've noted in the in the chat is the issue of uh, how well prepared we are in terms of delivering this care in the interim, given uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 seems to be a recurrent theme. And I think, Mike, we can address it after the presentation. Okay. okay. So um, is, am I better heard yeah, now? Hear you now and hear you. Okay. Yeah. So let me continue from where I had stopped about uh, Uganda's progress. I'm sure you can see those slides and I can move on. Like I said from the earlier presentation that the, the women are disproportionately affected. And um, this is the data we have, that 8% of adults are women living with HIV compared to 4.3% of the productive age group. The latest seroprevalence prevalence gave us a prevalence of 6 to 15 out of 100 pregnant women being infected with HIV, and this is uh, dependent on regions. At its peak, we had an annual infection rate of about 25 to 40,000 babies getting HIV from their mothers. And with the introduction of option B+, this has been brought down. As of 2015, the annual rate was 3,400, and as of 2018, the annual rate was about 466. 100,000. So we've made progress and we shouldn't lose this progress. This is going to be our The 3486 is of how many? Is that an absolute count? Per, one, per, per 100,000 ah, okay. annually. Because it, it appeared like it's an absolute count. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Thank you. 
Continue, please. Right. Now, one of the challenges, if you look, see the last slide, the last point, it tells us that at the moment, What do we do? It appears, but most of it's feeding. And that is an area dealing with uh, during labor and delivery, the breastfeeding is really causing us problems. And these are the statistics. If you look at this, that uh, the transmission rate is as low as 1.1% at six weeks. But then when the mothers continue breastfeeding, the transmission rate increases by 3.1, going as high as 4.1. That is for Uganda. You can see the rest of the country, much as we seem to be doing very well, but I think we need to do a lot more, as we shall see. Now, this is how to address and how to deal with some of these challenges of mother-child transmission. This slide shows us that uh, during pregnancy, we have factors that increase transmission and how we need to address these factors. I'll run through this slide because I can, I'm aware you can see what is being shown, but the high viral load is a big problem, but therefore all mothers should be on ART. We also should be reminded that new infections during pregnancy lead to viral spike, and that viral spike is a, a commonest contributor to mother-child transmission. Therefore, we need to prevent new and reinfection. And uh, there's also the issue of advanced age disease. If you recall the graph that we showed, and therefore we need to use ART to control this disease from progressing. Uh, the poor immune status is tied with a high viral load. We have STIs, which increase transmission and we need to screen and treat. Uh, poor maternal nutrition, really we need to improve the nutrition by giving advice and the hematinics that we give. Malaria and maternal anemia are tied together and therefore we need need to prevent malaria by giving intermittent presumptive treatment during pregnancy. Substance abuse has been shown to interfere with the integrity of the blood vessels and therefore increase the risk of transmission at the placenta level. And therefore we need to do a lot of behavior change counseling. There are procedures that we kind of have been familiar with, which we advise that if a mother is HIV infected, maybe we shouldn't be doing them during pregnancy. That is external cephalic version and procedures like amniocentesis and so on and so forth. When it comes to labor and delivery, again, the high viral load is an issue and we need to be aware of that. When we are not able to control the viral load, then maybe we need to move away from the vaginal delivery and perform elective C-sections because that one reduces the risk of transmission. Issues like prolonged rupture of membranes also increase transmission during labor and therefore we need to avoid artificial rupture of membranes. If they rupture on their own, then we need to expedite the, the delivery. We need to avoid prolonged labor by use of the pathograph and minimize instrumental deliveries like the vacuum, which causes uh, trauma to the fetus. Prematurity, we know that uh, infections are one of the commonest causes of prematurity, and therefore we need to treat infection so that babies are not born preterm. Chorioamnionitis. We need to see how that can be minimized by giving antibiotics if there is a rupture of membranes. And then there are procedures we do to the newborn using the NG tube to suck, suction the baby deep into the respiratory system. And we need to use safer methods like the penguin sucker. Again, during labor, there are obstetric procedures which we need to avoid. Uh, like uh, the electrodes that can be placed on the fetus, especially if the mother is HIV positive. There's the procedure which we can't avoid, and that is episiotomy, the commonest surgical procedure that is done. And we advise that uh, whenever you have to perform an episiotomy, ensure you have separate instruments for cutting the mother and for cutting the baby's cord. At least if you can't have scissors, have a, a razor blade, which I've, I've mentioned. During breastfeeding, the high viral load still takes the lead, and we need to address that. There are issues of breastfeeding per se. So if you can avoid breastfeeding, maybe you are better off. But then we have problems of challenges of not breastfeeding, which we are aware of. The diarrheal diseases, the RTIs, and the malnutrition. So we want our mothers to breastfeed. 
But how do we make breastfeeding safe? One of them is to avoid mixed feeding so that we can have either exclusive replacement feeding or exclusive breastfeeding. The long duration of breastfeeding has been cited, but in the presence of ART, we now recommend that the mother can breastfeed for as long as one or two years, but avoid mixed feeding in the first six months. But all this while, the mother should be on ART. There are challenges of the breasts, especially the mastitis, the nipple fissures and breast abscesses, and therefore you need to advise the mothers on how to attach and how to breastfeed safely. Again, poor maternal nutrition, wherefore we need to improve that. So these are the factors during postpartum period. Now, having gone through the mother-child transmission, I'm going to rush you through the prevention or the elimination. And uh, we have all had these terms. Prevention of mother-child transmission has been with us for quite a long time. Now we have to be familiar with elimination of mother-child transmission. They somehow go together. But by definition, elimination of mother-child transmission is uh, preventing transmission to levels less than 5% or 2% in a non-breastfeeding population. When we talk about prevention of mother-child transmission, we have two levels, the primary level prevention and the second row. Where primary level is preventing HIV infection, getting into the population, and second is when we have the HIV infected moms and we have to handle and deal with them. Again, here we are saying that while we are offering this service, we are not encouraging all HIV positive women to get pregnant, but uh, as you are aware, pregnancy and childbirth are human rights and women have to get pregnant. The aim is basically to ensure that women living with HIV maintain their health and stop their infants from acquiring it. Therefore, if we have to achieve elimination of mother-child transmission, the services should be offered right from before conception, through pregnancy, during labor and delivery, and through breastfeeding. And they should include things like early infant diagnosis, testing of the baby, and ART initiation of the baby who are, babies who are exposed. Now, how do we, what are the recommendations from the Minister of Health on how to do these things? There are basically three, there are four approaches, which have variously been referred to as prongs or approaches, strategies, or intervention areas. The first intervention area is primary prevention, which I've already alluded to. The second one is prevention of unintended pregnancies where women should conceive when they are ready. And this calls upon us to also offer them preconception care, as well as treatment of those who have fertility problems. Strategy number two is what we know and are familiar with as uh, PMTCT, whereby we have the HIV infected mother and we want to prevent transmission to the infant. It starts with quality antenatal care, quality labor and delivery practices, and quality postnatal care services. One of the things we have to do here is uh, provider initiated testing and counseling. That means that we shouldn't wait for the women to ask for the test, but we should offer them the test whenever they come to us at any point. And once we find that they are positive, we assess what care that is needed. Is it ART? We need to offer them adherence counseling and viral load monitoring. We need to screen for STIs, hepatitis B, and prophylaxis against OIs. We have to do the safe obstetric practices that I've alluded to. Provide them with postpartum interventions, which support on ongoing ART. Exposed infants to receive ARV and INH prophylaxis counseling these mothers for safer infant feeding practices and testing the babies to find out whether exposed babies have been infected or they have been protected. We also need to counsel these mothers in preparation for linking them to continued care because they will not remain with uh, PMTCT forever. They have to go on to ART and maybe adult ART for the mother. Definitely adult ART for the mother and maybe for babies who may be infected at the pediatric ART. So we need to prepare these mothers during the pregnancy period. Prong number four is basically provision of care, treatment, and support 
to mothers living with HIV and their families. I choose to call this MTCT Plus because to me this is transmission beyond mother-child transmission. Here we are looking at other children in the family, the husband, and so on and so forth. So we have there the package for the mother, the package for the exposed infant, and the package for the other members of the family. Maybe I'll focus on the other members of the family. Here I would like to test all of them. We would like to provide them with ART, TB screening, and OI prophylaxis. We need to discuss disclosure and adherence and then monitoring the immunity of the rest of the family. Now, this is a summary of what is expected of us as health workers. That at any point in a woman's life, she will be at eight of these four points. She's either pregnant, she's, uh, she, uh, sorry, the first one, there's something missing, but that should be before pregnancy. Either the woman is not pregnant and is planning to get pregnant or she's pregnant She's in labor, she's breastfeeding or planning to get pregnant again. So it's a cycle and uh, there's always something you can do. There are those who are yet to get pregnant or planning to get pregnant. You could talk about primary prevention, behavior change counseling, safer sex practices, HIV testing, partner disclosure, safe male circumcision and so on and so forth. That is for their partners. Then those who are pregnant, we've gone through all those things that we could do. When they're in labor, we've discussed some of the things that can be done, and even those who are breastfeeding. And again, once we finish with them breastfeeding, we know that maybe they are planning to conceive again, and we go back to before pregnancy. So this is really what I would expect that if all of us should be familiar with. I had alluded to this, that uh, elimination of mother-child transmission by definition is when we achieve less than 5% transmission in a generally breastfeeding population or less than 1% in a non-breastfeeding population. So what are these populations? Breastfeeding populations are generally defined as those that where the majority of the mothers breastfeed. And this is probably what is pertaining in most developing countries. In the developed countries, mothers can choose not to breastfeed and do it successfully, mm -hmm. and that's where those. In Uganda, we are implementing the test and treat policy, which involves. Can you hear me? Yeah, but someone is writing on your slide. Someone, I don't know who it is. But... We don't know, but it's okay. Continue. All right. So the test and treat policy in Uganda involves providing lifelong air at to people living with HIV, irrespective of their CD4 air at or their WHO clinical stage. It eliminates all limitations on eligibility and ensures that all populations and age groups are eligible for treatment. But it also ensures a uniform community message. If you recall, at one point, we had the pregnant women starting and stopping ARVs, and then the rest of the people would never stop. So it was confusing the community, whereby people had to explain what is special with pregnant women who start ARVs and stop. Now we are saying, well, whoever starts doesn't stop. So we now have a uniform community message. And again, the aim of this policy is to achieve elimination of mother-child transmission and syphilis in line with the national 1990 targets, which we've talked about. Now, I want us to discuss very quickly about the ARVs that we have to use. That's going because to be the next uh, five minutes, because the sure. questions are failing. Yeah, I should finish in the next five minutes. Okay. So all pregnant women should get ART. And uh, we all know that uh, whether virally suppressed or not, ART decreases the likelihood of mother-to-child transmission. And the goal, of all, the goal of suppression should ideally do, be to achieve maximum viral suppression. And we define viral suppression as a viral load of less than 1,000 copies per male. What are the benefits? There's decrease in viral replication, there's prophylaxis for the fetus and the infant, and also there's benefit for the woman's health. And yet we all know that childhood survival depends on maternal survival. Therefore, if we keep the mothers alive, we're likely to keep the babies alive. We should also decrease breastfeeding transmission if mothers are on suppressed regimens. 
and then the mothers can breastfeed for as long as possible. These are the recommended arrangements for adolescents and adults, and I've highlighted the ones for pregnant women. Um, for women who are already on TDF, 3TC, and efavirenz, the recommendation is for them to continue until after delivery at about nine months. That's when you can switch them to DTG. That is if they are virally suppressed. But if someone is initiating treatment during pregnancy, we recommend DTG instead of efavirenz. Now, when we have our mothers, we need to assess the risk of transmission. And how do you assess the risk to the unborn baby? We have what we can categorize as high-risk mothers, those who are newly initiated on ART in the third trimester, those receiving ART for less than four weeks, and those whose viral load is not suppressed. These are high-risk mothers, which means that transmission is very likely to happen if we don't do much. And therefore, we need to closely monitor them and ensure adherence support. How do we handle the babies of these ones? We give uh, nevirapine and for six weeks, and for those who are high risk, we give for 12 weeks. Again, we have already talked about the high risk mothers, but just for emphasis, these are people who have not received ART for less than, for, who have received ART for less than four weeks, whose viral load is more than 1,000, and they have been diagnosed in the third trimester. And if the baby comes to us after six weeks, that means the baby was born outside and is brought, we need to do a PCR as soon as possible, start the baby on ART, and then when the results come back, we can switch them to nevirapine, single nevirapine. If they are positive, then the baby is started off on the pediatric regimen. The mother, meanwhile, is started on ART, irrespective of timing for her own health. We need to monitor these mothers. We need to do the viral load, initial test at six months after asking ART. And if the viral load is less than 1,000, we repeat every, three, six, every six months without pregnancy. And if the viral load is more than 1,000, we improve adherence and evaluate. This is still uh, monitoring. I'll skip that one and that one, and then discuss the delivery options as I summarize. There are two options, as you are aware, vaginal birth and cesarean section. Before we make a decision, we need to know the viral load or the CD4 count and discuss the mode of delivery that we have. The vaginal birth would be a good option, but uh, the mother should come to hospital at the earliest sign of labor. We use universal precautions, the pathogram, do not rupture membranes artificially unless if the mother will deliver in the next four hours. Avoid invasive procedures and instrumental deliveries, minimize the ventus or avoid it. And you should have a low threshold for cesarean section in the event of slow progress. The cesarean section is indicated if the mother's viral load is unknown or greater than 1,000 copies at 36 weeks, if she has not taken ARVs for more than four weeks, and if she has not received prenatal care until after 36 weeks. To be effective, it should be elective, and we always need a pre-anesthetic review, and then we need to discuss her oral medication, as well as food, if, for example, the medicines have to be taken with food. For the babies, it is important for us to be mindful of confidentiality. We are aware that our primary patient is the woman, and therefore we don't have to just come and say with all the relatives around and we discuss HIV. So you need to check the level of disclosure that is acceptable. And for those who are not breastfeeding, to offer lactation suppression and give the ARVs. That one, we are all aware it is standard procedure. And I want to leave you with this take home message. That ARVs alone are not enough to reduce mother-child transmission. And we need to improve our clinical practice if we are to succeed and also modify the routine care that we offer to our women. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaga, for the presentation. I think there, there are questions that you have answered along the way, but this is still outstanding. Because uh, there is a question on mode of delivery. 
is is it mandatory that we deliver all HIV infected mothers by elective cyan section, even if the viral load is well controlled? I think that has been answered. Uh, but in the criteria of uh, delivering a woman by elective cyan section, I saw that if a woman has has not been on drugs for the last four weeks, and if this woman has really been under your care, I would not really wait for her to spend four weeks without taking antiretroviral drugs, and I prepare in the meantime to deliver by elective cyan section. Am I right? Um, maybe let me say something about the four weeks. The four weeks is, um, it is, it is assumed that viral suppression will be achieved after ARVs for four weeks. So anybody who has not taken ARVs for four weeks or more, it can be safely assumed or unsafely so that viral suppression has not been achieved. And that's really the background upon which we choose that we need to do an elective season because we are assuming, even if you haven't tested, we are assuming that the viral load is not suppressed if someone hasn't taken ARVs for more than four weeks. No, I, I, my aim is to just to re-emphasize the quality of clinical care that if someone has really been under your care and they're HIV positive, you, you need to continuously ask about their adherence to antiretroviral drugs so that you're not taken unawares that at the time of delivery, she has been off antiretroviral drugs for four or more weeks. Sure. Uh, the next one is a question that was left over from the previous presentation, that how are we making sure that we can offer these services uh, in the circumstances of COVID-19. How are we making sure that women get tested? How are we making sure that they get antiretroviral drugs? How are we making sure that they, they, are, they adhere to those drugs? And how are we making sure that they have safe delivery? Um, if you recall on the slide, which was focusing on um, prevention of transmission of, of HIV from HIV-infected mothers to their infants, we have what we call key strategies or key interventions. And um, I went through them, but I can remind the, the, the listeners and viewers. We've talked about provider-initiated testing and counseling. Means that a woman should not go through your hands without having an HIV test, regardless of what time she arrives, whether it is antenatal, whether it's labor and delivery or postpartum. And you realize that that's the starting point. Without knowing the serial status, we can't proceed. So if you can at least in your clinic or your or your practice ensure that all pregnant women have an HIV test, that will go a long way. Thereafter, having known the HIV test, then you now know what kind of care you need to offer this woman. And once we've started them on the ART, it's important for us to discuss adherence. It's important for us to discuss disclosure. And it's also important for us to monitor the response to the medicines. With that, we'll be able to achieve uh, our, our targets of reducing mother-child transmission. Of course, with the other things we've talked about, the modified obstetric practices uh, during antenatal labor and deliver and postpartum. Yeah, the next question is how are we going, how how can we make sure that women are retained in care? HIV positive women are retained in care. One person was actually throwing around a proposal: can we use biometric information? One yeah, one of the challenges actually, which is affecting mother-child transmission and success, is retention into care. Now, the literature that is available is that while mothers are is that while mothers are pregnant, they are motivated to remain in care, and most of them do. The challenge are those who actually have delivered, and sometimes they don't seem to see, to have a good motivation for, 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 for continuing in care. We have lost your voice. Hello? Yeah, someone interfered with my connection. 
<laughs> okay. Someone interfered with my connection. I hope I'm back. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, my phone like Sarah and someone interfered with my connection. Yes, so I hope you had my point about uh, continuity of care and uh, uh, adherence support and viral load monitoring. Those are really responsibilities of us health workers and um, we need to ensure that we as health workers, the, we have the duty. You know, in healthcare, we have what we talk about as claim holders and duty bearers. We are the duty bearers and we have a responsibility to ensure that this, ha this happens. Uh, thank you very much, but I just have a small addition on uh, retention in care. Uh, all of us do not know where we stay, or do we? I may be wrong, uh, because if they ask where you stay, you stay next to a mango where tree. Stay yourself? Yes, next to a mango tree, that road on the right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same problem which, which has affected our healthcare delivery. I, I think I, I wrote this sometime on the chat on EMA that when we have, we see these patients in the referral hospitals with chronic conditions like hypertension, diabetes, or cancer, we do not actually have information about their physical location. It would be easier for someone to continue care at the nearest facility to them. But then we do not know where they actually come from. So importantly, that one thing which you should really like try to promote to retain people in care is to make sure we know their physical address. And uh, like Muju has maintained about over 90% retention in care for their studies because they have the, lo the locator information for each of their participants. And that's what we actually need so that if someone does not move out of the place A without really updating their locator information for you to make sure that they are retained in care. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Musa, but uh, maybe one other additional thing is that while we can have the locator information, we should have the capacity to reach out to these people, which I yes. think Modu does. If we don't have the capacity, we should at least be able to contact these people so by phone or kind of follow up, but that's really very important. Yep. And then there's another question. Uh, why is transmission? A bit for them? Jonathan posted that question about uh, the follow up of these patients. What did you know in? the perspective of COVID, how are we able to retain this the COVID? Maybe I can, uh, there's a question there on the, how are we ensuring continuity of care during the COVID-19. What I can say about this is that the guideline from WHO and uh, UNICEF is that we should do remote, we should be able to do remote services that is antenatal definitely not labor and delivery but at least antenatal should be we should be able to have the capacity to do this remotely be able to contact these women be able to reach out to them and that brings back what Musa has said about locator information so the facility should be empowered with the capacity to trace these mothers if they're having challenges of transport to reach out to them and also to even talk to them by phone if they don't have to come to the facility. You, you know very well that if we can minimize contact with others, that would help. So if we can reach out to them remotely, either by phone or by whatever means, then we should be able to know what is happening to them. We should be able maybe to take off the samples from them if there are any tests to be done. We should be able to cancel an adherence and also to supply them with medications. That way we minimize contact with the healthcare system where they could get COVID-19, but we keep in touch with them where they really have to continue with care. Yeah, there's another question is, uh, why is transition to DTG from effervilence recommended at six, nine months among postpartum mothers and not any time earlier than that? Um, one of the reasons why we are we why one of the reasons why 
there is a recommendation to transition from a favorance to DTG is about the safety profile in terms for the mother herself. Definitely, there have been concerns about safety for the baby, but those have kind of been uh, handled, and we now know that DTG is safe. However, this recommendation applies to those who are already in care and they are virally suppressed. Now, we don't want to interrupt this kind of regimen which is suppressing the viral load for as long as the mother is pregnant and breastfeeding. Because once we introduce DTG, we now have to start the viral monitoring afresh because you never know what happens. So we are looking at a mother who is pregnant. We are looking at a mother who is breastfeeding and is virally suppressed and is tolerating the fibrins very well. So we'd like to continue and probably interrupt that when we know if there are any challenges of the new drug the baby is not adversely affected. Yeah, there's also something else on DTG. It is associated with uh, some level of hyperglycemia and the pregnancy is also hyperglycemic state. So we would wish that first we initiate the DTG after every effect of pregnancy has actually went off and the woman is almost back to her pre-pregnancy state. Otherwise, if someone had uh, gestation diabetes, like and then you initiated DTG at uh, two months post delivery. I think it would be a little tricky for you to differentiate between DTG initiated or pregnancy initiated uh, hyperglycemic control. Uh, this, the next one says, apart from the, what precautions are to be observed during elective seizure? For those with indications for emergency seizure, what extra precautions should be taken? I think the universal precautions for every woman should be taken because we are dealing with an infection and therefore we need to prevent infection to the health worker, but we also need to prevent transmission of the infant. Again, we talk about separate instruments for the mother and the baby and the usual universal precautions that need to be done. Uh, I think there is another question which I mean, we could all of us um, try to uh, uh, answer that, yes, the strategies of uh, preventing or retaining in care HIV positive women are known, but how are we implementing them or how are we implementing the services in face of COVID-19? I think a simple one would be that, yes, we know that there are challenges with COVID-19, but knowing and doing are different things. You may actually, you need inputs into implementing the changes that you want to put in place. For example, it would not be very nice for Kagawa who is managing the PMTCT program to invest his salary into a telephone and also load it with the airtime <laughs> so that he keeps in touch with the pregnant woman who comes back in. So this is something which we must continue debating on how are we, I mean, we can propose how we are going to make sure we get there. We have to keep in touch with the patients we see. There is something there from Linda, but maybe before we go to that, I wanted to address uh, Moses Adroma's question of how would you deliver a mother whose viral load you don't know. I think I tried to address that, that uh, by proxy, you look at uh, how long she has been on ART, how she has been adhering, and if she has been on ART for more than four weeks, it is expected that the viral load is suppressed. If less than four weeks, then the viral load is not properly suppressed and you have to decide to deliver her by cesarean section. Yeah, and there's a question on uh... COVID-19 has a lot of restrictions now. So what modifications do we have to, do we have? I beg to have these responses. Uh, you know, maybe what I can say about that is that, um, I don't know whether these restrictions are in terms of COVID-19, because COVID-19 and labor and delivery is a whole presentation of its own, which we can have another day. But we've basically discussed how to handle the HIV in the COVID era with all its restrictions of movement, contact with the healthcare system, and so on and so forth. But I don't know whether Linda Navita can be allowed to talk because she has said some, she has written something there.
Linda or is Jonathan? Which of, of the two? Can we have Jonathan go first? Uh, uh, sorry, I was muted. Uh -huh. uh, yes. As I've uh, written uh, in the chat box, uh, as Minister of Health, we've prepared guidelines for provision of routine services, uh, including uh, EMTCT. And our expectation is that services should continue uh, with observance of uh, SOPs, and uh, most of our implementing partners have provided tents so that uh, we are able to have social distancing pieces uh, that the, the health workers might need. So uh, essentially, our expectations that service and we just observe the COVID-19 18 SOPs. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, uh, Linda. Yeah, possibly the other additional thing is uh, we all accept that the Minister of Health has put in place interventions, but we also need to be cognizant of the fact that whatever is in place possibly is not enough. Uh, ideally, those people in those tents should be having, each should be having a mask, and sometimes you look at the masks they have, <laughs> and you get ashamed of yourself. <laughs> so we still remain uh, to deliver this message that we have to look after the patients great and we also have to make sure the patients don't come to our facilities and get infected from there. And we also have to make sure that those who come under our care do not actually cause us harm, do not cause harm to the people who are giving them that care. Uh, can I hear from uh, Jonathan? Are you mute, Jonathan? Um, Chair, thank you so much. Um, I really uh, don't have much to say, but I was just wondering about, yes, we have guidelines, we have policies here and there, but you know, the translation of these guidelines and policies into practice is one thing. So I was basically interested on the practicabilities of whatever we have um, at the level of service delivery. But I think I was able to get a number of key points here and there that people have said, and uh, I'll continue to really um, get some of this, uh, this uh, documented and, and so that we are, I'm able to know what we are doing exactly for the elderly, for the adolescents, for the young people and so forth. Otherwise, I don't have much, thank you. Okay. Uh, the bottom line is that we all have to rethink. <laughs> the, uh, we all have to rethink the health service delivery model in face of epidemics. Uh, because we have all lived in and worked in, a, in health facilities that have little to nothing. It's not uncommon to find the surgeon entering a theater and they don't even have a gown. The only thing they have is a mask and they don't even have a head cover. Uh, so it is, I mean, that's what we have lived through. But that's, uh, that puts everyone at risk. The mother you're operating on at risk, the baby you are delivering at risk, your assistant at risk, and the whole team you're working with. So we really have to rethink how we are going to be doing the right thing to prevent infection spreading within the hospital setting. And one, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it is not like all is lost on COVID-19. It is also like nice it came <laughs> because it will help us to improve uh, the diagnostic abilities in health facilities, especially those at the regional district and, and national level. And maybe uh, in addition to that, we need to also kind of develop locally um, developed methods of doing things as long as they're within the guidelines. Some of the things may appear so difficult, but you might find they are not very complicated, like the issue of locator information for mothers, our BHT people can help there, like the issue of contact and telephones. We now have telephones almost everywhere, and uh, we should be able to keep in touch with our mothers. So these are some of the things which can be implemented. Maybe 
managers would have to facilitate those workers with the airtime. Hopefully, we can manage that very well, and so on and so forth. So this can be really locally looked at. Because sometimes the guidelines from the center need to be modified to the context. Yeah. Dr. Musa. Yes. I'm listening. Dr. Yeah. Musa, there, there, there was a hand from Wise Work or Sam Godfrey. Mm. And then there was a hand from a bone Chris, and then there was another hand from Fida. But I think they put them down. Maybe yeah, if you could uh, give them a chance to. Wise Work, can we hear from you? Chirikumino, do you have your hand up or you have changed your mind? No. She has written here that she needs, she wants the slides. Maybe that was the purpose for the hand. <laughs> All right, we'll send out the slides, that's fine. Do we, we had a hand from Wise Do we still have it? Do you have a question? And I'm not seeing any, any hand up. I and I think we have exhausted um, what we are supposed to do today. I again want to thank the presenters. I think there are issues must have been solved. We can uh, finish up with the remaining questions. Do we have any questions? We don't seem to. Sheila, can you type your question because it seems to have become problematic. Sheila, you are mute. Uh, you could type your question. She's mute. Uh, Sheila, you are mute. We can't hear you. But I think she can hear us. To talk, I could see her trying to talk, but then there seems to be a network problem. Sheila, can you type the question? There was a question for Dr. Nakubura, which... Uh, can you please type in? Which was pending. I don't remember what it was. No, it was about the preparations for COVID. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the presenters for sparing time and making the preparations that have seen us uh, go through these presentations today. And most of all, I would like to thank the people who spared time to listen in. I mean, to get uh, 109 people on, uh, on Zoom is not easy. I'm really very excited about the enthusiasm. Uh, I leave it to the NASMEC committee to- Special on Monday. I beg pardon? I, I leave I'm just it saying a special on Monday. A special on Monday for people to be, to attend this many, it is, it is not usual. I'm really excited about it. And this is a way possibly we are going to have to live with if we are to improve uh, communication across ourselves. I'm also very thankful to the IT team which has uh, put this up because uh, I, I lagged a bit behind. <laughs> I could not find where I'm supposed to be yet. I was the convener, so it was a bit of a challenge. We look forward to having more interactions in future. Uh, Ah, uh, uh, Mike, can you answer this question in the chat very briefly and then we call it a day? For a mother who is in a discordant relationship, how long do you give uh, post-exposure prophylaxis to the husband? I think uh, that is pre-exposure. Pre this is prep? This is prep, pre-exposure pre prophylaxis. Okay, very quickly, and uh, I think we're closing. This seems to be, I don't know if it was the person who was trying to speak. 
but very briefly, this comes in at the point of um, the second strategy, prevention of unintended pregnancies, and maybe preconception care. That is where we come in as health workers to prepare these women for pregnancy. Now, we know pre extend it in a, in a couple who normally want to recommend it when they really want to have a baby. Otherwise, if, they, if it's not uh, for purposes of procreation, maybe they can use the condoms and other methods for recreation. Now, for procreation purposes, we would advise that uh, if, for example, we have assessed the mother and all other parameters are okay, I'm assuming the mother who is, is one who is positive. We have cancelled her, we've started down treatment, the viral load is suppressed, she's not anemic and so on and so forth, then we, we can safely say she is fit to get pregnant. And that's when you would start the husband on PrEP for a period of about one month. And during that period, we hope that the woman would get pregnant. We very well know how to advise them on the fertility period. And then we monitor them. And if the mother conceives, then the man will take the PrEP and once the mother has conceived, one month later, uh, protection for purposes of recreation. So you don't advise. I that hope the man... uh, Doreen. I hope I've answered Doreen's question. So you don't advise the man to take antiretroviral drugs forever. <laughs> No, 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 no. For purposes of procreation, sex for procreation, they can have their condoms and all that. But you know, we advise the prep for that moment when we think they have to have um, unprotected sex for purposes of having a baby. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. I leave it to uh, Eladuan team. Uh, we have um, come to almost 10 minutes before the end of the hour. I think I'm very grateful that we have covered both topics. We meet again. Nice time. Bye-bye. Thank you so All much, right. Musa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Musa. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much uh... I think, Dr. Kajimu, you can, uh, you can close the session. All right. I um, just want to thank you for the presentations, uh, Dr. Mike uh, Kagawa, Dr. Sarah, and Mosa for moderating this session. I just want to make a few announcements before we all exit. We have, uh, this was our fourth webinar in a series of uh, five-part series. We'll have our very last webinar next week on Monday, and we'll be talking, uh, sharing the recent, uh, most recent research and publications around antenatal care uh, period. So uh, please join us again next uh, Monday, uh, same time, 2 p.m. You can use the same link that you used to join if you signed up for uh, both webinars, or you can register again for two, uh, next Monday's webinar with the same registration link that is sent to your email. I just want to emphasize that we send out the recordings and uh, presentations in form of an email. Uh, I noticed for some people, because we are sending bulk emails, they might go to your spam or to a promotion email. So please just cross check. If you're using Gmail, check in the promotions content. You will see an email from uh, National Safe Motherhood. Uh, if you haven't received, we'll still keep updating our contacts and see that with that you get all the recordings. We haven't sent out the one for last Monday, but it will come out uh, in due course as well. Uh, thank you very much. We thank you for participating in these webinars and have a good day. All right, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, the presenters. Over and out from Barara. Thank you, Dr. Waswa.